Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to continue as I told you about the union examination. So we just have a small recap of what I have uh, told you yesterday. I have told you about uh, the importance and indications of union examination. Urine, as you know, is the excretory fluid that is filtrated by the kidney. So any change in the pre-renal, post-renal or the volume of the fluid, anything that affects all these things will be affecting the urine. So, uh, one of us talk, so this is a container that uh, is used for uh, the collection. So there will be the labeling that has to be done and the type of examination you want, whether you want a culture, whether you want a, a routine urine examination or particularly for proteins or creatinine or whatever you're measuring, this has to be mentioned here so that there won't be any mix up so that is important and uh, as you know that as we have seen the physical characteristics of the urine i told you about the appearance color quantity of the urine uh, that is there so appearance is usually this is the normal appearance it is clear if it is having any hazy appearance or cloudy appearance it may be because of amorphous substances bacteria or proteins so we have to do the uh, test which is necessary to uh, demonstrate those things in that urine. So that is about the appearance. The color is usually pale enough because of the urochrome pigment. So the urochrome pigment is uh, dependent upon the metabolic rate. So there in uh, high metabolic uh, states that is uh, fever and also thyrotoxicosis, you have uh, this pigment a uh, slightly uh, more that's why it will be more uh, yellowish in color. So the color of the urine depends upon the hydration, depends upon the constituents of the urine, depends upon the uh, volume, right? So we've uh, spoken about all these things in the last class. So the quantity, whether you are having polyurea more than uh, 2000 uh, ml or 2 liters then oliguria less than 500 ml and anuria less than 50 ml in 24 hours or complete cessation depending upon the renal uh, disease so this is uh, these are the three things then we spoke about the strength if you remember and also given an example of the tea so here, uh, if for the strength, we see that there, sh uh, there should be a proper measurement of the pH and also the specific gravity. The pH, uh, if the uh, urine is uh, acidic, uh, the blue litmus paper turns uh, red. And then if it is uh, uh, alkaline, the red litmus paper will be turning blue. That will give you an indication of the pH. As you know that the pH uh, is important also in uh, uh, formation of some sediment uh, that is uh, organized or unorganized sediments uh, that we'll be seeing here. So that is about uh, the, what do you call it? Uh, the volume, color, appearance and also the quantity, right? So the other thing is the uh, specific gravity. Specific gravity, I also gave you an example if you're taking just a cup of water and putting some salt or uh, glucose or whatever. If uh, that same uh, glass of water uh, quantity is uh, taken half, that is half uh, glass of water is taken and uh, the same one spoon of glucose is moved. So the specific gravity will be higher for the lower volume. So the oliguria conditions will have a higher specific gravity and all the polyuria conditions will have a lower specific gravity depending upon the volume of the fluid and the amount of the solute that is present. So the solute versus the solvent is the indicator of the uh, specific gravity. So there are wide ranges of specific gravity. We have some uh, accurate measurements of the specific gravity that can be seen. I also told you some special techniques that are being used that is either by catheter or uh, from the ureter or from the urethra or there can be a suprapubic aspiration which can be done in infants. So there is another thing which can be used. So this is the thing which will collect the urine in the infants. Here uh, the urine is collected. So this is the specialized instrument uh, which will be used for collection of the urine. Nothing but the urine bag like thing. Okay, so this is about what we have discussed in the last class. So coming to what I'm going to talk about 
today chemical examination already we have finished about proteins heat coagulation or other methods right already you know what these tests are uh, you must know the conditions where the proteinuria is present and the grading of the proteinuria accordingly where there is mild moderate and severe proteinuria then uh, uh, we have seen about the sugars regarding the uh, tests uh, done for the sugars for all this we have the reagent strip tests also which are being routinely done in the hospital then we have seen about the blood the blood can be with an intact rbc that is hematuria or hemoglobinuria so we have to differentiate both and then we can do it by urine microscopy i have also told you that uh, these uh, there is a specified test called the benzidine test you know the benzidine uh, solution that is prepared uh, for this uh, uh, blood examination in the urine so what i'm going to tell you is that for any chemical examination and for any practical examination for that purpose i told you that you have to know why we are doing it then we have to know the essential components involved what experiment we are going to do in the test the principle of it the procedure the result and the interpretation whatever you call it. so that is the state of the writing what you have to do in your examination so now coming to the chemical examination we have the ketone bodies bile pigments bile salts and urine microscopy so what are ketone bodies they are the intermediate products of the fat metabolism as you know acetone histoacetic acid and beta hydroxybutyric acid are ketone bodies they are usually the abnormal components which are seen in either uh, diabetes uh, or starvation wherever there is abnormal fat metabolism okay so used up fats will now turn into ketone bodies and then they are excreted in the urine usually we do the test for acetone and histoacetic acid rather than beta hydroxy butyric acid so what test we do is rothras test the principle of the test is that there is components remember sodium nitroprusside okay and then you have to know what are the uh, things which we are doing for it so acetone and histoacetic acid react with the sodium nitroprusside in the presence of alkali to produce a purple color compound that is the principle of the test so how it is being done it is that nit sodium nitroprusside is decomposed to sodium ferrocyanide sodium nitrite and ferric hydroxide in alkaline medium so you have to give the components and alkaline medium for them to react so these chemicals are strong oxidizing agents react with ammonium hydroxide to produce a purple milk so what is the procedure 5 ml of urine in the test tube you are saturating with ammonium sulfate then saturation means you add it you add ammonium sulfate to dissolve add it dissolve add it again dissolve at one point the ammonium sulfate won't dissolve further so that is that is the point where in you will stop adding ammonium sulfate and then you will start adding two drops of freshly prepared sodium nitroprusside then what you do is you run you catch the test tube like this and then you run the liquid ammonia to one side of the tube so that it forms a layer on the top okay so this is a reaction that takes place and then it gives a permanganate caramel red color or purple color that is formed at the junction of the two solutions brown ring is not a positive reaction so you have to get a purple ring so interpretation brown or no negative paint traces dark purple ring positive so sensitivity of the test is 1 to 5 mg per 100 ml so what are the alternate tests alternate tests for histoacetic acid you have the same thing the same component 5 ml uh, urine is taken but that by solution of ferric chloride drop by drop you are adding then you filter it take a filter paper filter it and then if diastic acid is present the filtrate will develop a brownish red color okay so the hard test i told you rothras test for acetone and histoacetic acid gerhardt's for histoacetic acid so 
the test we don't do usually is the for uh, beta hydroxybutyric acid that is hard test reagent strip test is common for all of uh, the chemicals which are present in the urine so where you find ketonuria uncontrolled diabetes in fans and children acute febrile conditions toxic states whenever you start either because of uh, pregnancy or uh, if there is any cachexia severe exercise one week is disease where there is abnormal metabolism so coming to the other one there is this is the bile salts and pigments in the urine as you know the bile salts are the folate and keno deoxycholate bile pigments are the bile verdin bile rubin and bile cyanide right so the test you do is a haze test there the principle here is that the bile salts will reduce the surface tension so procedure is that you just take urine sprinkle some sulfur granules on it and then the particles sink to the bottom bottom if bile is present treat a sample of distilled water take urine take distilled water sprinkle uh, the sulfur powder if the sulfur powder sinks then there is uh, it's a positive test you can act uh, the distilled water acts as a control while we compare the urine with that of the distilled water okay so you are taking distilled water and the urine sprinkling uh, the sulfur powder then you compare both to get the result so where do we see this uh, bile salts is that you see in case of obstructive jaundice so here you have to remember the ketone bodies are present the significance is of presence of ketone bodies is a product of abnormal metabolism and then significance is uh it may be a sign of an impending diabetic ketoacidosis or a coma right here it is uh, for bile salts it is a obstructive jaundice so bile pigments in urine and stool of various types of jaundice what we see is here see if you are thinking we know that the bile pigments can be bilirubin or urobilin also we'll compare it to the nature of the stool in normal person usually bilirubin is absent urobilin is present a small quantity dark colored stool that is a normal then hemolytic jaundice the urobilinogen which is normally present is increased and the dark colored stool will be there in hepatic jaundice the urine there is increased bilirubin in early stages okay then the urobilinogen is decreased in early stages the nature of the stool remains pale in early stages and dark in late stages if you remember the bilirubin metabolism which in the conjugation uh, will be affected when the liver is affected so that's the reason why the bilirubin itself is present in the urine because it is not getting conjugated so the urobilinogen is a product of the conjugated bilirubin right so that's the reason why it is decreased so the nature of the stool also is pale initially and then gets darker in obstructive jaundice as you know again we have this increased or dark colored urine and the urobilinogen is variable either decreased or absent and the nature of stool is pale because the color of the stool is given by the stercobilinogen that won't be present in obstructive jaundice so that's the reason why the stool is pale remember the bilirubin metabolism Uh, the bile uh, metabolism in the liver then you will understand this the liver is essential for the conjugation of the bilirubin so i'm just repeating it the hepatic jaundice you have high bilirubin and then urobilinogen the product of conjugation is not present as a result of obstruction also we do not see the stercobilinogen that imparts color to the stool that is not present so that's the reason why you see pale stools in obstructive jaundice so what is the test for bile pigments it's a pouchet test so what is the principle after precipitation of the bile pigments by barium chloride it is oxidized by acids to derivatives like biliverdin and bilisine so what is the reaction this bile pigments will react with barium chloride the resultant is this precipitate of barium sulfate that reacts with the pouchet reagent okay so if you don't remember this at least you have to write this 
end up color. Okay, so the bile pigments react with the barium chloride. The precipitate that is formed reacts with the Fauchet's reagent to give this a green color. Take 2 ml of acid urine, add 1 ml of 10% barium chloride solution. Mix, wait for a few minutes for the precipitate to appear. If there is no precipitate, add 1 to 2 drops of saturated ammonium sulfate solution. Then filter through a filter paper, add 2 drops of Fauchet's reagent. What are the components of Fauchet's reagent? Trichloroacetic acid and ferric chloride. So you have to remember all the constituents of all the reagents. So what you can do is while you are preparing for your exam, take a book, take what reagents are used in what, how much ml of urine, how much ml of reagent, what color it produces. Make a table for yourself. Okay, when you make a table for yourself, it will be easy. If I do things for you, it won't work out like that. So what you have to do is, what urine examination, what reagents are used, what is the sensitivity of the test, what amount of urine is used, what amount of reagent is used, uh, then uh, what are the components of the reagent, what is the color or the result of the interpretation. Just make a chart out of all these things so it will be very easy for you. So the interpretation, a positive reaction is indicated by blue or green color. This test is more sensitive than the iodine or nitric acid ring test. So the sensitivity is this. Okay. So the alternate test is a foam test. Take just a urine in a test tube, then shake it. Then what you see is formation of yellow froth. The yellow froth is because of the presence of bile salts and the color is due to bilirubin. That's a very easy test. Then there is something called as Mellin's test. It is nothing but the nitric acid test. You take 2 ml in test tube. And then in the same thing, you take 2 ml of urine. Then there is this green color that is being appearing. That is presence of uh, the bile pigments. Okay. This can be done on filter paper or porcelain plate. The other test we have is the reagent strip test. So we have this bile pigments tests are Number one, Fauchert's we have seen. Number two, foam test. Three, Melin's test. And four, reagent strip test. Okay. So, the test for urobilinogen, we are doing this Ehrlich's aldehyde test. Take 10 ml of restaurant in a test tube. Add 2.5 ml of barium chloride. Mix well and filter. Take 2 to 3 ml of the filtrate. Add 0.5 ml of aldehyde reagent. Allow it to stand for three minutes. Then see top column of the urine against white background. Why you should see it against white background? Because there may be a subjective error. I say one color and you say one color. The exam, uh, you, you will not be able to get what I am telling you and uh, what you are telling me. So there should be some standard um, uh, uh, color, right? So we have to standardize that by putting a white background. So a pink color denotes the presence of urobilinogen. So Helix aldehyde reagent contains what? This is the composition of the Helix uh, aldehyde reagent. That is 2 grams of para dimethyl amino benzaldehyde in 100 ml of 20% hydrochloride. So just remember 2 grams of para dimethyl amino benzaldehyde in 100 ml of 20% HCl. There is no way out. If you just listen to all this kind of chemicals and compositions, you will not be able to get it. So, what you have to do is write the test, write the reagent, write what all are necessary to do the procedure, then the components of the reagent, how much ml of urine you are taking, how much amount of reagent you are taking, and the color you are getting in the result or the interpretation. So you can repeat this test in these dilutions. The more dilute, the more sensitive the test. The report should be in terms of highest dilution. So if I am doing a test with 200 dilution, then that is the more sensitive and more uh, positive reaction. So other test, test for chyluria. This is, uh, you know, the chyle uh, imparts white color or milky color appearance to the urine. 
So what we have to do is equal amounts of urine and ether in the test tube, then turbidity will be clear. That is imparted by this chyle to the urine. So that means that the chyle is present. So until now we have seen about the chemical examination, the ketone bodies, Rothra's test is the main test, and the other tests also you have to know the alternate test for everything. The bile salts, haze sulfur test, bile pigments, pouches tests, other tests also you have to remember. For urovilnogen, Ehrlich aldehyde, then the chyle. The chyle is the one which we are just uh, adding the ether and then the checking for the turbidity. So these are the tests until now what we have read in the chemical examination. Okay, now coming to the microscopic examination. As I told you, that we have to have a centrifuge. That is, you have to put a test tube in a centrifuge machine that revolves, right? See, the revolutions per minute may vary according to the urine you are testing. And then usually, if you take a 5 ml urine, you have to have a moderate speed of 1500 revolutions per minute. RPM is nothing but revolutions per minute for 5 to 10 minutes. After centrifuging, what you have is a sediment which is transferred to a glass slide mounted using a cover slip, examined with a low power microscope and subsequently the high power. So at least 10 representative fields have to be taken before you give out the report of urine microscopy. Why we are doing the centrifuges and examining the sediment? Because you want to know about the cast, the puzzles, blood cells, crystals that settle in the bottom of the tube that is that is forming the sediment. And if you are thinking in terms of a bacteriological examination, as such in the cases of urinary tract infection, you will be doing a centrifugation at totally 3000 revolutions per minute. That is the highest speed. The moderate speed is 1500 that you do routinely. But if you are doing a bacteriological examination, then you prefer doing this. So, what are the precautions? Fresh urine only must be examined. Because why I told you, right? The sugars may get lower down, there will be, uh, there will be abnormal uh, uh, formation, uh, there will be some uh, more urates and uric acid. Uh, crystals can be formed, there can be an unorganized sediment that can be interfering with your interpretation of the urine microscopy. So that's the reason why the urine must be fresh. A thin preparation without air bubbles should be made. That is important. If you are seeing an air bubble, what is the point in examining? Condenser of the microscope should be low and the light should be cut down. Otherwise, highland gas may be missed. Okay, so I'll just tell you the procedure. So we are having this urine, this is from a patient. Then we are taking it in a 5 ml, it's taken in a test tube. I am placing this test tube in the centrifugator machine. As such, we are getting the product. For example, I am centrifugating uh, this blood sample. Then you get this layers of plasma and then the sediment is settled down. So this sediment is taken. And then here, put it, the sediment is taken by the dipper and then you are dropper and then you are placing it on one end of the slide. Then you are placing a cover slip over it. Then you are sealing the sides. So the sealing the sides is important and seeing that there is no air bubble is also important in this procedure. So usually 1500 revolutions per minute, 10 to 15 minutes. If we are doing a UTI, suspecting UTI and doing the uh, bacteriological examination, then we will be doing it for 3000 revolutions per minute. So what you see by low magnification is gas, large crystals, debris and parasitic ova. In high magnification, we will see specific structures of gas, leukocytes, erythrocytes, fat droplets, crystals, sperm, debris, bacteria. All these things we can be seen. So, what is the importance of this? Gas in at least 10 low power fields. Report. See, how we are seeing is that I told you that at least 10 low power fields have to be seen. So, gas. 
to determine the number of gas per hyperfield, we have to see at least 10 dopa fields. Okay. Then you have to use the hyper to identify which type of gas is it. Okay, erythrocytes, leukocytes, and renal epithelial cells are identified by the hyper objective. At least 10 hyper fields reported as per hyper field. So, gas per low power field, the erythrocytes, leukocytes, epithelial cells per high power field. So, what all we have to comment on urine microscopy? Urine, when you get it, you have to also see the uh, physical characteristics, the color, volume. You can use a litmus paper, check the pH or the reagent strip test to check the pH specific gravity by the uh, uh, squibs uh, albinometer. Then you can have this uh, comment now uh, with the squamous transitional cells if present in large numbers as fragments. Bacteria is if microorganisms are present or not, crystals and the low power, large amounts of mucus if it is present or not. Confirm the following results with cytopathological examination that is crystals. More than two renal epithelial cells per hyperfield, pathological gas is very present, atypical mononuclear cells, particularly urothelial cells, tissue fragments, and pathological crystals. So, as you know, that now that you know how we are doing the urine microscopy, second one, what we have to see under low power, what we have to see under high power, how we have to report it. Then now I'll come to individual cells that we examine in the urine microscopy. Okay. RBCs appear as you know are biconcave, usually they appear colorless. Sometimes if you are seeing there can be this cremated RBC or the dysmorphic RBC can be present. Okay, these are the indications usually 0 to 1 or no RBCs are present. But if there, if you are seeing RBCs more in a female patient, you have to have a menstrual history because there can be a contamination of the urine by the menses, uh, menstrual blood. So we have to uh, cross check with that, then we have to check for number of RBCs. Any increase in number of RBC, at least three, that means that you are seeing an abnormal uh, RBC thing. So as I told you, the RBC syntax is an indication of hematuria and uh, that is presence of blood is abnormal and can be a potential pathological uh, damage that has happened at the level of kidney or by a stone or malignancy that we have to examine. So pus cells. Pus cells are nothing but the neutrophils. You can see the three lobes here. Usually they are colorless. Usually all the cells in the urine are uh, appearing colorless unless and until you impart a color to them. So this is how they appear. These are the neutrophils. So these are the eosinophils. What you see, eosinophils in urine are very, very uncommon. Even if you are seeing one eosinophil in the urine, that means it is a potential uh, indication of some pathological uh, change in the kidney. So we usually have this. Uh, this is uh, a picture which is uh, stained by the back. So you are seeing numerous eosinophils here, the bilobed structures. See here, these are the bilobed structures, the spectacle shaped uh, structure. So this is a result of either acute interstitial nephritis or an infection, uh, or it can be an indication of a drug allergy or something like uh, penicillin. Whenever there is a drug allergy, that can be uh, uh, cause a damage uh, to the kidney. That is the analgesic nephropathy. In that, you can find this eosinophils in the urine. So we have seen about the RBCs, neutrophils. Uh, five to eight uh, persons. That is the neutrophils is common. But if it is more than ten, that is uh, indication of an urinary tract infection, then you should ask the person to have a urine culture. Eosinophils, even one is present, that is 
indicative of damage either by an infection, acute interstitial nephritis, or drug induced or an analgesic nephropathy. Okay, so here the squamous epithelial cells we have these are these are the squamous epithelial cells that you see. This is how they appear. They are polygonal in shape, and you find this nucleus like this. So this is. Uh, these are the cells that uh, can be seen one or two usually if there are more that means that there is something going wrong so this is a transitional epithelial cell uh, that can be uh, seen so this is a stain which is staining the this is a clear picture of a fresh urine sample having a transitional epithelial cell here you are seeing the stained cell these are the three stained cells that is the transitional cells. These transitional epithelial cells can come from anywhere from the ureter and the urinary bladder. So any stone or anything if it is there, this number can increase. Or in malignancy, you can see that these can occur as some dysmorphic or dysplastic forms. So renal tubular epithelial cells, you can see these are the cuboidal cells uh, you have seen, they are stacked together. So these renal tubular cells, if they are more in number, they can indicate the damage to the tubular epithelium. So here we see in a clear microscopy, we can see that this is the oval fat body that is attached to these fat droplets. These are the fat droplets that we are seeing here. And under polarized light, oval fat bodies showing Maltese cross appearance. This is the Maltese, Maltese cross appearance. Okay. So remember that there can be abnormality uh, in the normal constituents of the plasma that when uh, released into the urine, that is abnormal. More number of RBCs, more number of neutrophils, even one is neutrophil. Okay, then you can see that uh, there is this fat droplets that can be seen and then polarized light is nothing but uh, in your childhood you must have seen this kaleidoscope, right? You will be changing things and all. You know, there will be this light, the polarized light is consisting of all the colors of the video. So that is the polarized light that will give you the Marty's cross appearance in the if the urine is consisting of this uh, oval fat bodies, this is the oval fat body that is attached to the fat droplets. So, what things you see, usually see, there are, if the uh, degraded things, degraded cells are forming an organized sediment that is called a cast. If the degraded cells or any uh, metals or chemicals that are present in the urine or the drugs taken by the patient are form, forming an unorganized sediment, then it is called a crystal. So what you see here is whenever there is a renal tubular injury, the epithelial cells slough. Okay, that means they are uh, detached. So these, uh, they are caught in a mucoprotein matrix and then they form this cellular cast. So, with time, epithelial cells degenerate, no longer be recognized as the cells. Within the hyaline matrix, they become coarsely granular, finely granular cast. Waxy casts are the final step in formation of cast and indicate chronic renal tubular disease. So, I told you, casts are those which are forming the organized sediment so whenever there is a renal tubular injury they these epithelial cells get detached they get attached to a mucoprotein complex like tom house protein if it is just tom house protein it is usually a hybrid cast if it is having added some other substances then it will form a cast and it will lose its individual cellular appearance and then form a granular cast. Finally, it will lose that granular thing also and then it will become a waxy cast that is the formation in the chronic renal tubular disease. So this is a cellular cast, the initial phase, chronic granular 
coarsely granular cast, finely granular cast, and the waxy cast. This is the cast which are formed. So the cast types, matrix, hyaline cast, I told you how it is formed, the tam mass called leukoprotein. Waxy often broad in use. Inclusions, if we are having any other epithelial cells with mucoprotein, additional substances like protein, cell debris, it can form granular cast, triglyceride, cholesterol, and stress, form fat globules, hemocytin granules, crystals forming casts are uncommon, melanin granules are very rare. So this organized sediment is this cast. So pigment, hemoglobin, myoglobin, bilirubin drugs, cells, erythrocytes, red blood cell remnants, lymphocytes, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, and hysterocytes, renal tubular epithelial cells, mixed epithelial cells, erythrocytes, neutrophil, and renal tubular cells and bacteria. So first, renal tubular epithelial cells are getting detached. They form a complex with the mucoprotein. On that, if we are seeing any bile, then we may think of a, a pigment that can be a granular cast that can give, impart a finely pink color or brown color, which is indicative of a hemoglobin. Okay, that can have erythrocytes or red blood cell that is called a red cell cast. It can have leukocytes, it is called as a granular cast. If it is having bacteria, it is called as, uh, it is having this uh, pus cells at all with the bacteria. So these are the impregnated things over the renal jugular epithelial cells in the mucoprotein complex, which is uh, differentiating or classifying different types of gas. So here we are seeing the final broad uh, thing that is chronic cardiovascular injury. Initially we see the cell, the cellular integrity is completely lost, the granules are uh, lost and we see just the waxy gas. These are the granular gas. Okay. So these are uh, the example, the cellular gas here, uh, what you are seeing is, okay. So the cellular integrity is still maintained. It is not a waxy cast or a, a granular cast. See here, you are seeing a proper cellular cast. Here we are seeing numerous liquid droplets. Okay. Fatty cast, it is fat cast, it is called. This is a hemocytonic cast. Okay. Here we have the bilirubin cast that can be seen in the cancer of the liver. Okay. So crystals, crystals are the un, uh, unorganized sediment that is uh, caused by precipitation of the urinary soil. It, the crystal formation depends upon the pH, temperature and concentration. Appearance in the urine, either as true crystal material or amorphous. Amorphous means granular material. Okay, majority of the crystal formation takes place in refrigerated specimens. Why? Because the temperature, because of the pH, will be altered in long standing urine. So that's the reason why, while I was speaking yesterday, I told you that preservation is necessary. Regardingly, we have to add that preservative according to what test or what uh, suspicion the patient is uh, under. Okay. In vivo, increased solute concentration is typically responsible for crystal formation. So in vivo factors, we have this uh, pH, diagnostic and therapeutic agents. Say for example, you are uh, imparting a contrast to that uh, patient, then that may have uh, potential uh, formation of a crystal. Crystallogenic agents, in vitro temperature evaporation and urinary pH. So, we will divide the crystals formed in acid urine and alkaline urine. Okay. In acid urine, we have this urates, uric acid crystals, cysteine crystals, calcium oxalate crystals, uh, then uh, tyrosine crystals, eucine crystals. Uh, okay. These are the main ones. Okay. In the Alkaline urine, we have triple phosphate 
uh, crystals, which are the main ones in that lot with the diphosphate uh, crystals and others to follow. Calcium carbonate crystals, all of that belongs to the alkaline unit. So we'll go with each one of them. Whenever you are reading a crystal, see for cast, you have to read like what is the material. For granular cast, it is the WBC or whatever. Okay, then in fat cast or lipid cast, you are seeing the fatty globule. So depending upon the constituent, you are naming the cast. Okay, here in crystals, you have to read it like what kind of crystal is present in depending upon the pH, whether it is acidicurin or alkaline. That is the first point you have to learn. The second point you have to learn is whether they are radio opaque or radio lessened, all these things. Okay. At least you have to remember the shape. Okay. If not the radio opaque and radio lucent things, you have to remember how they appear. Okay. And then at what pH they appear. At least these two things are mandatory for you to remember. Okay. After this human examination class, I uh, kind of tell all you guys whoever are listening to this class to make a note of what uh, the chemical composition uh, of each reagent, uh, all the tests uh, used in the chemical uh, testing of the urine, you will be writing down as I told you, like the urine examination, the reagents, procedure, principle, result, interpretation. You will be writing them, put, uh, take a picture and then you send me, okay? Send to Girish or somebody, Kumar, then they'll send me, okay? You are doing this, this is an assignment for all of you, okay? And at the same time, after the chemical composition, you will be doing this also, that is the crystals which are formed in the urine. You will take what are the crystals formed in the acidic urine, just write the shape. Decide what kind of crystal it is and then write the shape. That I want all of you guys to write. Take a picture and then send me. Alright. I will give you one week's time. By the next week, all of you guys have to send me that. Okay. Now, I will just complete this now. The amorphous urates can be formed in the concentrated urine with slightly acidic pH. They are like brick dust. Okay. Brick dust is nothing but it is like a, a sprinkled granular material okay that is amorphous that that is not having a proper shape you see this is the type of amorphous urates you are seeing okay now coming to the urate crystals there these are the diamond shaped crystals that can be uh, observed okay this these are the uh, Crystals giving the birefringence like uh, light under a specialized polarized microscope. If you see, you can see this kind of a crystal. Okay, see here, these are the uric acid uh, crystals, what you are finding. See, the uric acid crystals uh, can be seen in many, uh, in acidic pH as the name denotes. So amorphous urates and uric acid crystals have a property of uh, uh, dissolving by heat and sodium hydroxide. Okay, so these can be uh, dissolved in sodium hydroxide and by heat. Okay, now these are the calcium oxalate crystals. Uh, these are these can be either this envelope shape or this uh, dumbbell shape, okay? So here you are seeing a, a proper dumbbell. Dumbbell, I think every man lives, uh, every woman lives now uh, these days. So these crystals are insoluble in hydrochloric acid. That's how we differentiate from the cystic crystals. So we have seen amorphous urates, which are reddish brown granules like thing, and then urate crystals. Uh, that can be uh, seen as a diamond shape or cubical shape. You know, there are many variable uh, ranges of uh, the crystals that can be seen. And here we are seeing the calcium oxalate crystals either in the form of uh, envelope or in the form of a 
dumbbell and they are insoluble in hydrochloric acid. So the other crystals I told you are the cysteine crystals and they are highly refractive uh, hexagonal plates and then they are uh, soluble in hydrochloric acid unlike the calcium oxalate crystals and uh, they are insoluble in acetic acid that's how you remember about the cysteine crystals okay the other one are the uh, tyrosine crystals that i spoke about that uh, occur as a black needles or sheaves uh, of grass there can be some sulfur crystals that can be uh, seen with the treatment of the sulfur drugs and then there can be hippuric acid uh, crystals uh, also so for acidic urine you are seeing amorphous urates, uric acid crystals, calcium oxalate crystals, cysteine crystal and then you are seeing tyrosine, leucine, um, hippuric acid and sulfur okay eight now coming to the other crystals uh, in alkaline urine usually we see this coffin lid type of crystals here coffin lid uh, as you know what is a coffin lid so this is the a coffin lid type of triple phosphate uh, crystals that are seen in the alkaline urine they are nothing but the ammonium magnesium uh, phosphate. Uh, this can be seen with the infection of uh, proteus which is seen in the alkaline urine. So uh, also we see the dicalcium uh, phosphate uh, that is uh, appearing in the neutral uh, urine. So we are uh, seeing this type of uh, alkaline thing and this dicarbonate I um, mean, uh, dicalcium phosphate crystals appear as colorless prisms with bevelled edges. Okay, that is about the dicalcium phosphate crystal. And then these are the calcium carbonate crystals. As you see, there can be dumbbell shaped, small dumbbell shape. And then there can some calcium carbonate crystals also appear as uh, spears. Then ammonium biurate usually appear as. Uh, this thorn apple, thorn apple crystals. So these are ammonium urate crystals uh, having an appearance of thorn apple. Okay. The cholesterol caps usually appear as rhomboid. Okay. They have a notch at the corner and then they are usually uh, rhomboid. See here, just a, a repetition of what I told you in uh, acidic urine, you are seeing the amorphous urate, amorphous uh, urate, uric acid, calcium oxalate, cysteine, tyrosine, leucine, hippuric acid, sulfur. Okay. And here in alkaline urine, you are seeing triple phosphate or ammonium magnesium phosphate, dicalcium phosphate, calcium carbonate, and ammonium biurate crystal. That is the thorn apple and the cholesterol. Okay. Dumbbell shape, calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate crystals. Okay. Amorphous phosphate, the reddish brown granular like thing. Coffin lid, frustrated form. It can have like this appearance. Then ammonium birate crystals, thorn apple. So here you see that uric acid crystals have varied appearance. They can be diamond shaped, they can be like this, rhomboid shaped, whatever. These are the sodium urate, amorphous urate, calcium oxalate, either dumbbell shape or envelope shape. Sulfonamide crystals, tyrosine crystals, sheaves of needles, cysteine crystals. Here you are seeing these are the cysteine crystals. I told you the cysteine crystal dissolve in. Hydrochloric acid, not in acetic acid. These are the leucine crystals. Okay. So, after this, I will be telling you about the cytological preparation of urine examination. If we are trying to find out if there is any malignancy or not, it is the same thing. The preparation 10 minutes, 1200 to 1500 are, uh, are being evolutions per minute. You will send you a sample and then there can be Shard slides recommended for better attachment. Albuminized means you are sticking them, you know, like a pedicure, you use this. 
then filtration in cyto or centrifugation based preparations then it can be stained by pap cell block means sediment is taken and then it is uh, added with formalin then it is made like a tissue and used for biopsy indications endometriosis calliculite papillary tumor and papillary carcinoma see usually in females sometimes the endometrial tissue is not present in the female genital tract it can be present either in the urinary bladder or somewhere else so which will be uh, whenever there is a menses there can be some uh, dysuria that is happening so that's the reason why there can be some hematuria or rbc or hemoglobinuria that can be seen associated with endometriosis so that's the reason why whenever you are seeing a suspecting the endometrial tissue abnormally present in the urinary tract then you can think of doing a urinary cytological examination calliculi calliculi may damage the renal tubular epithelium wherever they are present in the urinary tract that can be seen as a as a calliculi or it can be seen as a slugged off renal epithelium papillary tumors can be of various types benign or pun lump uh, and then this papillary carcinoma the malignant counterpart of the uh, carcinoma bladder so here we are seeing uh, this these are the transitional cells i have seen i have shown you the normal transitional cells how they appear right uh, i'll just show you once again so that you will know so these are the normal transitional cells these are benign looking they are they are just peaceful you know they are at their own peace this is normal looking and they are having smooth borders okay see here in comparison with a carcinomatous cell what we see is see they are having irregular margins of the nucleus irregular borders of the cell then they are, these are having a irregular shape and prominent nucleoli so this is an abnormal picture which is an indication of a diff poorly differentiated uh, tumor of uh, the bladder so loose cluster irregular nuclei prominent nucleoli high nc ratio that is nucleus is more than the expected cytoplasm in the other cell you saw a very less uh, uh, size nucleus compared to the cytoplasm here the nucleus is very large compared with the cytoplasm okay so this is about the cytology so i told you i am giving you an assignment write down the various crystals and the shapes and the ph what they are seen in and then the chemical examination of urine that assignment you will be uh, showing me as uh, a photograph taken in whatsapp to kumar or somebody and then as them to send to me by next week same time right okay that's all for today